If you look up tea in the first cookery book that comes to hand, you will probably find that it is unmentioned, or at most you will find a few lines of sketchy instructions which give no ruling on several of the most important points. This is curious, not only because tea is one of the mainstays of civilization in this country, as well as Ireland, Australia, and New Zealand, but because the best manner of making it is the subject of violent disputes. Today, we're having tea with George Orwell. Hi, I'm Jen from Tea Leaves in Tweed, and welcome to another historical tea session. This morning, I'm actually sharing the historical tea session that started the entire series for me. You see, a while ago, I wanted to make a tea video about George Orwell's rules for brewing a cup of tea. But as I went through, I found there were certain aspects of it that I couldn't achieve. Well, I now have a way to achieve some of these aspects, at least in spirit, if not in the letter of the law, according to Orwell. So I am going to take you through Orwell's rules for brewing tea, and we're going to enjoy tea with George Orwell. So let's brew. So here we are in my kitchen, and to give you a little spoiler about Orwell's rules, one of his rules is that the teapot must be warmed up on the hob or the stove. And the reason I couldn't do this video before is because I did not have a teapot that I felt comfortable putting on the stove to warm up. However, the people at Kitchen Kite have sent me their stovetop safe teapot so instead of warming the pot on the stove and then adding boiling water, I can actually boil my water directly in the teapot so that, as Orwell says, the tea hits water that is actually boiling at the moment of impact. So now let's back up and we'll go through the rules one by one. The first rule is that one should use Indian or Ceylonese tea. So I have a tin of Tailors of Harrogate English breakfast, which is a blend of Indian and African teas, but given that the African tea industry was kind of grown out of the Indian British tea industry, I think that will suffice. Secondly, the tea should be made in small quantities, and if you know me, you know that this is not a small quantity of tea for me, but it is not an urn or a cauldron, as Orwell mentions, and he specifies a one-quart teapot later on. Thirdly, the pot should be warmed beforehand. This is better done by placing it on the hob rather than swilling it out with hot water. So let's turn on our teapot. So I will let the water come to a boil and then I'll meet you back here. So now that our water has come to a boil, we can move on. So the fourth rule is that the tea should be made strong. For a pot holding a quart, he recommends six heaped teaspoons of tea leaf. And fifthly, the tea should be put straight into the pot with no bags or strainers or devices to imprison the tea. So I've actually removed the uh, infuser basket from this teapot. And sixthly, one should take the teapot to the kettle, not the other way around, so that the water is actually boiling on the moment of impact of the tea with the water. So since our teapot and our kettle are one and the same, let's put our tea in. Well, that was exciting. <laughs> so 
so that was a little adventure but everything seems to be okay so I'm going to take our tea back to the tea room and wait for the leaves to settle. I did give it a stir as Orwell suggests in his next tea roll. Well now that we have made a thoroughly exciting pot of tea based on Orwell's tea rules I can see that the leaves have started to settle out a bit so I'm going to pour my tea. Interestingly enough Orval doesn't actually give a steeping time. He just says, add the tea to the boiling water, give it a stir or a good shake, and then let the tea leaves settle. So this has been steeping for a few minutes and I can see the leaves starting to expand and settle. And I think part of this is because it helps you not uh, get so many leaves in your cup because he doesn't recommend any kind of strainer and he doesn't think you should worry about eating a few tea leaves with your cup of tea. So moving on, he says that Eighthly, one should drink out of a good breakfast cup, not a little tiny teacup. So he recommends a larger cylindrical breakfast cup, and I looked this up, and officially a breakfast cup is 300 milliliters, or about 10 or 11 fluid ounces, while a teacup is only about 200 milliliters, or like 6 or 7 ounces. So we have our good breakfast cup. This is my Bunnykins mug. It's what we would call a mug. Ninthly, one should pour the cream off the milk before using it, and I'm lucky to have a source of non-homogenized milk, as Orwell would have used, so I can pour the cream off my milk, or rather I can pour the milk into my pitcher without uh, shaking the cream back in. So I have my milk. Not quite skimmed milk, but it's not quite as creamy as it would be if it were all mixed up. And if you do mix the cream in, it sometimes leaves these little fatty blobs, which I agree isn't terribly enjoyable. And tenthly, one should pour the tea into the cup first, and then add the milk. And lastly, unless you're drinking in the Russian style, which we'll get to, tea should be drunk without sugar. So let's make my cup of tea. Add my milk. I'm going to add a little more milk because that is a very strong cup of tea. So here's tea with George Orwell. Ooh, that is actually really good. You get that kind of body of the milk because the tea is strong enough that you can put a lot of milk into it, but it still tastes like tea. But the milk takes enough of that kind of bitter edge off of it um, that it's, this is a really nice cup of tea. <laughs> this would be fantastic in the morning. Mm. I think I do feel braver, wiser, and more optimistic for this cup of tea. So those were George Orwell's 11 rules for making a cup of tea. I hope you enjoyed this historical tea session and I hope I'll see you again sometime. Bye.